Okay, welcome to another Seminole War Talk. We are going to be talking about Major Dade, Major Francis Langhorn Dade, born in 18, or I'm sorry, 1793, 1792 or 93, and he is from King County, Virginia. The Dade family was mostly from Virginia, and you probably don't know anything about his military background or his career, what, what he did, and where he got what he did, and what happened afterwards. So we're going to tell you a few things on that. And most probable, you never heard of some of these things before. So if I can get the photos working right. So anyway, you probably know of Major Dade. Let's see. Uh, Sorry, I'm just still getting used to this here. Okay. No, I don't know. Okay, maybe that's it. You pretty much know it, Major Dade, that he's famous for dying at the battle. Uh, they carelessly went out into Seminole territory and didn't put out his flankers and got ambushed and he was the first one to kill. Now this uh, photo from a reenactment a few years ago, Major Dade would be the one on the horse with the white plume signifying inf infantry and the black guy playing Louis Pacheco, that's HL. He's a real nice guy, a uh, soldier in front walking that's uh, Ron Jerome. He passed away a few years ago, sadly. So this photo is a few years old. Anyway, Major Dade from King, King George County, Georgia. His parents died when he was an early age. His father died when he was about 14. And then his mother was trying to support him, but I think she eventually passed away as well. And so Major Dade, he had an older brother, Lawrence, and he had an uncle also named Lawrence. Uh, the problem with the Dade family genealogy, it's a regular mess. And it's hard to keep track of. Uh, one of the things that we have a problem with is that there's uh, so many family members with the same name. This is uh, Major Francis Dade, his uncle, uh, this is Lawrence Terrafero Dade, and he, he's pretty much considered to be kind of like the foster father of Dade or paid for his school or helped him send him through school. Um, he was a kind of like a general during the Re Revolutionary War, important in the Virginia legislature, so there's some political connections. Uh, anyway, so Francis Dade, he was able to uh, get a commission in the army during the War of 1812 as a ensign or third lieutenant in 1813. And so uh, Major Dade, he was very active in the War of 1812. He was on the Niagara frontier, uh, involved in some of the major battles of the war, maybe Chrysler Farm, I, I have to check up on that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. After that, Major Dade was in the 4th Infantry Regiment in the First Seminole War when Florida was handed over from Spain to the United States. In 1821, Major Dade was there to accept the flag. And so most of his career was either in uh, Florida or New Orleans area, except when he did a trip up north for, for recruiting. Um, that's maybe why we don't have a painting of, of Dade, because he was in areas that, you know, were kind of the end of the world. Uh, Florida, the, in Pensacola, Pensacola was pretty much a frontier town. And when he was in New Orleans, uh, most of the time he was at Fort St. Phillips which is about 60 miles down river in Plaquemine Parish. And we'll tell a little bit about that more. 
So uh, Dade, I keep wanting to say Major Dade, but Francis Dade, he got uh, promoted to captain in 1818. And he got married in Pensacola a few years later in 1827. Let's see if I can bring this up. He married Amanda Dade, uh, Amanda Middleton. Uh, Amanda Middleton, she was a daughter of a prominent um, person in the Pensacola. And so they got married at Christ Church in Pensacola. And here, let me get you a picture of it. Uh, If I can get this to work. Okay, that's Christ Church in Pensacola. They got married in 1827. Dade has um, most of his time in Pensacola. He was at Cantonment Clinch, which is right near Fort Barrancas. It's the kind of the Army barracks and headquarters in Pensacola at the time, right outside the city limits. Uh, Dade and Amanda, or Francis Dade and Amanda, they had two children, two daughters. You probably only heard of one daughter if you've heard of any of them. That was uh, Fanny. Fanny was born uh, about 1829-1830. And then they had a second daughter, which you've probably never heard of. Her name was Virginia. And I was doing some research, looking around the old newspaper clippings. And I found about in Fredericksburg, Virginia in 1833, died in this place age 17 months and 25 days, Virginia Lawrence Sieta daughter of Major Dade, Lawrence Sieta, kind of a female take on his uncle and his brother's name. I said they recycled the name. She is buried in an unmarked grave in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Died at about 18 months old. Uh, it's the daughter nobody heard of. So I wrote the library or wrote the church up there to find out more information to confirm and all the evidence points that she was daughter of Francis and Amanda Dade. In fact, the newspaper article says Major Dade. There was only one Major Dade in the Army at that time. So anyway, Dade, he's uh, one of the higher ranking officers in Florida. And there's not too many soldiers in there in the 1820s. So when trouble happens between the settlers and the Indians, he's ordered to go drive the Indians that are outside the reservation in the center of the state outlined by the Treaty of Moultrie Creek. So he goes, you know, over to the Suwannee and Francis State, he builds uh, Fort Duval and now what's near the mouth of the Swanee River where it meets the Gulf, the, what today is the town of Swanee, which is south of Old Town, about, I don't know, 12 or 18 miles south of Old Town. Fort Duval was in existence for about two months. It was 130 feet by 140 feet. It had one blockhouse and they built uh, log buildings, uh, barracks and quarters for the enlisted men and officers. I said officers, but there's only two officers. There's Major Data, a lieutenant. There's only 38 men at the company, uh, so it's about half the strength of the company. And they're, they get pretty sick on the campaign. They're not very well. So he asked for help. You know, Dade complains that he doesn't have enough soldiers. So Governor Duval of Florida, since 20, Appalachia Creek warriors under Chief Cochran from uh, what is now Blountstown, 
Um, they go down and they help assist on the army for a few months. And afterwards, the government awards them peace, presidential peace medals, the regular treaty peace medals that you might be familiar with. These ones have the President John Quincy Adams on the front. And so Day, he goes up and scouts around the Osceola River and as far north as Thomasville, Georgia. Months later, he's back in Pensacola. And so Dade starts writing letters and fast and furious. He writes to his uh, garrison commander, his regimental commander, uh, Duncan Clinch, writes the Secretary of War versus James Barber, then it was Lewis Cass, uh, Ar Army Adjutant General Roger Jones, even General Winfield Scott. And I imagine he doesn't ingratiate himself very well with the army on some of the complaints he makes, because some of the complaints are really problems that are plaguing every regiment and company, it seems, at the time. One thing he complains about is that his companies only have strength, and that he needs more men for the company, which is a common problem at the time. Uh, didn't have enough men, other companies in the regiment should be doing the field maneuvers that he's doing. He says it seems like it's always unfair that he's always the one going out into the field. And so, you know, he sends out those letters. Uh, and he says the Swanee uh, fort they built at Fort Duval, he says it's ineffective, it's too far away. And he does recommend one thing that's a really good idea that is uh, recommended also by uh, Colonel Clinch, uh, Duncan Clinch, and that what he recommended was that they establish a military post at the Indian Agency, which will later become Fort King. And we're familiar with F Fort King near Ocala. So Dade's company is, uh, it leaves Florida and 1827 and goes to New Orleans. And then they complains that he's at Fort St. Phillips. And it's very sickly, men are deserting, really just for the constitution, health of this man, he should be in the city of New Orleans and not 60 miles south in the, the, in the bayous there. Uh, he complains about Fort St. Phillips, he says, uh, he has a lot of men who desert and they catch him and they're convicts in the stockade. He has a, a youth who enlisted and lied about his age that has to be sent home. One of his soldiers is a veteran of the War of 1812 and he's too old, they need to retire him, which they end up doing. They, you know, give him the certificate of pension. They age shorter men. The fort floods all the time, you know, it's right on the water. It's, um, you know, if you've ever been down there to Fort Jackson, Fort St. Phillips, you know, you're about at sea level. It's a uh, flood's very bad. It flooded out in Hur Hurricane Katrina real bad. Dade's also complaining that the supplies sent to him are not very good. His shoes and boots they receives, they last uh, just a few days or a few months and they fall apart. They're not very good quality, and no cannons are mounted at the fort. Um, so he writes all these letters of complaints, and General Scott writes back, says that no injustice has been done to Dade's company. They did their duty. Uh, Army Adjutant General Roger Jones writes back and basically tells them to shut up, you do the assignment you're told to do <laughs> there. And a little bit more about that in a minute. And Governor Duval and the Indian agent, uh, James Gadsden, who's also famous, you know, Fort Gadsden's named after him, and also the Gadsden pur Purchase out west after the Mexican War, uh, he also arranged that. No, they are writing letters back and forth saying that the Swanee Post was needed and it was vital to be there at the time that it didn't do some good work. And Duval also says, you know, we need to drive the Indians west of the Mississippi. 
Uh, Governor Duvall has been talking about removing the Indians from Florida since 1823, the, since the Treaty of Moultrie Creek. Um, so it's their intention to remove the Indians all along. It's not just Andrew Jackson who's talking about removing them. In 1828, Dade asks for brevet rank, this uh, promotion where you receive the rank but not the pay. And it's temporary. It's just a way the Congress saved money back then. So he's given the promotion to brevet major in 1828 because of his 10 year service as a captain. And Dade, at the same time, he writes in his letters, he really is due a lieutenant colonel. It's because of his time and service and the command and all the work he's done, which I imagine his commanding officers are kind of getting tired of hearing of him. And it kind of makes me wonder that if uh, Dade went on his fatal march where he was killed, uh, he didn't have to go do that. And maybe that he was doing that as uh, to show how good he is in rank to get the points because you know, back then in Florida, they weren't getting much opportunity to show themselves in battle. In 1842, Dade is doing his recruiting up in, uh, up north in uh, Fredericksburg, but he's in New York as well. And he's writing uh, the Secretary Army saying that at Fort Wool on Bedloe Island in New York, it's a recruiting post, a recruiting depot. It's commanded by Captain William Belknap. And Dade says he really deserves to be commander of that post as a recruiting area of his skill and ability in Belknap. He hasn't been captain as long as Dade was. Uh, Dade has more rank and uh, time and service. And also he's due an extra $10 a month commanding pay that Belknap is getting and Dade is not getting. So, as I mentioned, he's not really getting any favors by these complaints. And so the Army Adjutant General, Roger Jones, he writes back and tells him to shut up. It's not his decision or his command on where he's stationed. You know, he's an infantry soldier. He's, you know, not a artillery soldier who sits around the fort the whole time. Okay, so Major Dade, his company gets sent to Key West. You would think that uh, Key West is a great place to be stationed at, you know, your island, you go fishing and sailing. Not so much back in 1834. They, uh, there's a lot of conflict between the posts and the um, local citizens. I believe at one point that day uh, prevented the citizens from coming in the fort and selling whiskey. And so they tried to get the sheriff to arrest Major Dade <laughs> or one of them. It was kind of ridiculous. And so see if I can bring this up. The picture I took of oh. I'm learning. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm still learning this. Okay. And so, of course, Major Day gets killed in the battle, what we call Dade's Battle, near Bushnell, that we've had reenacted for every year since early 1980s. And of course, most famous for getting killed and being buried in St. Augustine. Uh, Major Dade's wife and child, I can bring that up. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed. Okay. Major Dade's daughter, Fanny. 
Fanny Dage, she dies in 1848, is buried in St. Michael's Cemetery in Pensacola. That's her right there, right near the back fence. And his wife, Amanda Dade. Amanda Dade, she dies in 1867, about age 60, and is also buried in St. Michael's Cemetery in Pensacola. She's buried there with her Milton family members. So the Seminole Wars ended, or the Second Seminole War, part two of three parts of the war has ended. And interesting newspaper account I found. I can pull that up. Um, and get rid of all that first. So what happened is that General Jessup gets a hold of a shotgun alleged to be a shotgun that was a owned by Major Dade when he was killed at the battle so many years ago. And in the newspaper article, oh, don't see it. I can get it up. Okay, I think I got it now. Okay, General Jessup writes, you know, inquiring if there's any Dade family members that uh, he can pass this on to the family members of Major Dade. And so he contacts Colonel John B. Dade, who's a distant cousin in Washington, D.C. John Dade is superintendent of the penitentiary in Washington, D.C. And he says, Major Dade has a brother. I can pass it on to him. And so we imagine that he may have done that. Either John kept the shotgun or he passed it on to Lawrence Dade uh, because soon after, uh, not long after this, uh, Major Dade's brother, Lawrence Dade, his wife dies and then uh, Lawrence drops dead a few months later. So Major Dade's brother is gone a few months after this newspaper article. So it could have either remained with Lawrence's son or could have remained with John Dade, uh, who uh, may have passed it on to his son-in-law, who, whose daughter married a daughter of John T. Sprague. So the Dade and the Sprague family and Colonel Worth, uh, William Worth, they're all related by marriage there. Interesting thing about John Dade is that he had a son who was in the army, Captain Townshed Dade, who was in the 2nd Dragoons Regiment. And when he was in Palak area, he was uh, cashiered from the army or thrown out of the army, court-martialed uh, for drunkenness and uh, behavior unbecoming of an officer. And so he was kicked out of the army. Make a long story short, uh, he dies in 1841, the next year, and is buried in the Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C., because, of course, his father is head of the penitentiary in Washington. And so John Day doesn't have any sons left, but, you know, his wife is married to his son-in-law, uh, who his son-in-law also dies not long after that. So the big mystery is what became of Dade's shotgun. Did it stay with the Dade family? Did it go to the Sprague family? Did it end up handed out to somebody, end up in an antique store, lost in time? You know, that's a curious mystery we'd like to know about.
Um, the Dade family genealogy is very confusing because they recycle a lot of the names, Francis, uh, Lawrence, Townshed, uh, Langhorn, uh, even some Washingtons mixed in with there. And uh, Alexander was another famous family in Virginia. And so it's like every generation recycles the names. And it's just a mess figuring out what Dade's family connections and history were. So it's been kind of fun researching for that because it's, you know, like a tangled knot to undo everything. So I hope you found this interesting, learning all these new and interesting things about Major Francis Langhorn Dade, the uh, most famous officer of the Second Seminole War that nobody knows anything about. And okay, have a good evening or good morning and hope to do this again.